Running back Dexter Bussey with us tonight. Always good to see you guys. Got a former quarterback, Mr. Eric Hipple, is with us tonight. Come on out here. In the 1980s, a six-time Pro Bowl tackle, Lomas Brown. Tight end out of Grand Valley State, Rob Rubick, also one of the team's preseason voices. Rob wanted me to spin it better than that. A very handsome man will go with that. Linebacker played at Notre Dame and the Lions as well, Mr. Scott Kolakowski. era, and there's a lot of linebackers that would attest to that. Welcome, Corey Schlesinger. Good to see you, Corey. Now it is my pleasure to introduce the Detroit Lions management and coaching staff participating in tonight's town hall meeting. Please join me in welcoming Lions team president, Tom Lawan. Mr. Sheldon White. Yeah. 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 Head coach Jim Caldwell. Yeah. Yeah. Offensive coordinator yeah. Joe Lombardi. Yeah. Yeah. Defensive coordinator Terrell Austin. Special Teams Coordinator, John Bonamigo. And it's great to have all of you up here. We're going to start the evening by introducing each of them individually and just giving them a minute or so to talk about their position within the organization and what they do. And then we'll dive into some of the more specific questions. And we'll start with Team President Tom Lawan. Thanks, Dan. Um, I really want to spend my minute uh, just thanking everybody for coming out. Uh, this really is a special <coughs> evening for us. I mean, it's a great, what, what an unbelievable turnout. Uh, the amount of support, getting the chance to talk to some of you at the, as you came in tonight and just now walking through the crowd. It's, uh, it's really exciting, a lot of energy. Uh, to add to the energy that we've already started to feel with, with Jim and his staff starting a few months ago, and then the players coming back into town uh, a week ago today when we, uh, we got to start our off-season program. So there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of energy and excitement at our practice facility, uh, but there's great energy and excitement here tonight. Dan said it in his introduction, you guys are an important part of this franchise, and without your support, we just we simply couldn't do it. So thank you for coming out, thank you for supporting us, and, and, and we promise we're gonna give you some, uh, some football we're supporting, so thanks again. down the line to the Vice President of Pro Personnel, Sheldon White. I thank everyone here also. Um, Sheldon White, uh, native of Dayton, Ohio, Miami University graduate. Spent four years playing football there and track, ran track there also. Got drafted in a new, by the New York Giants in 1988. Spent two years there, three years at the Detroit Lions, and then finished up in 1993 with the Cincinnati Bengals. At that time, uh, coached at Miami, Ohio for three years, and then the Detroit Lions hired me back. Finishing up my 17th year now, Vice President of Pro Personnel. Basically, I'm involved with evaluating the entire National Football League, all of the players, 
uh, throughout the course of the year. Also trying to stay a step ahead in the coaches and front office as far as just trying to make sure any injuries or any type of movement that we have on our rosters, we have to be ready to replenish it. So doing that, and then after that, finally just preparing for the free agency meetings, uh, getting everyone involved, bringing in the front office, the, the, uh, the uh, negotiators, as well as the evaluators and the coaches, and making sure that we pick the right players for the Detroit Lions. Sheldon's actually being modest. Uh, somebody earlier tonight said, Hey, Sheldon, you were the part of the last really good secondary the Lions had. He's putting pressure on me right now. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, now he's got to find us the next one in his current job. So <laughs> it's a pleasure to also welcome the new head coach of the Detroit Lions, Mr. Jim Carter. <laughs> so uh, we're thankful to be here tonight and have an opportunity to come and, um, and touch and uh, get a chance to talk to um, what's considered, obviously, the heartbeat of our fan base. Um, just an exceptional group of people. I had a chance to meet some as you were coming in the door. It was a lot of fun. Uh, I've uh, certainly been well received in this community, and, uh, and we're looking forward to some great things. Our players just came back a week ago today, so I've had an opportunity to work with them a, a week or so. Not out on the field as of yet. We'll get that done next week. But uh, it's an exciting group of guys that are willing to work, very conscientious, and we have a great staff as well that are putting them through their paces right now, trying to make certain that we catch them up on all the schematic changes, and we're looking forward to a great challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Pleasure to introduce a couple of new coordinators as well. Let's start with offensive coordinator, Joel Lombardi. Exciting to be here. You know, I spent a few years in junior high here in the Detroit area and had very fond memories of that. And uh, married a Michigan girl. My wife's from Bay City, Michigan, so uh, she's happy to be back too. So uh, we're excited. Uh, like Coach said, it's a great coaching staff. It's fun to be a part of, and uh, it's been great to get the players back in these last couple weeks and, and get a chance to start working with them. So um, can't wait to get started. And, and I just hope that you guys give us the, the kind of home field advantage that uh, we know you're going through. It's going to be exciting. Yeah. Defensive coordinator Tara Lost. Again, this is uh, like Joe. Uh, I did spend some time here in the state of Michigan uh, when I was at UM, uh, late '90s, early 2000. That time, and it's a great state. It's a great state for football, and I couldn't be more proud to be a part of the Detroit Lions. Uh, being here when I was, no matter what happened, we always knew that the fans would support the team, come out and cheer the lines on. And our goal this year is to make sure that we cheer deep into January. Yeah. Yeah. He's not a new coordinator, but we're very happy to have him back. Special teams coordinator John Bonamigo. Great pleasure to be back here and part of this new staff and this new regime. Uh, we're looking forward to great things and uh, could have ended up in a lot of places, but there was nowhere else I really wanted to be. I am a Michigan native. I went to high school here and I'm a proud graduate of Central Michigan University. <laughs> well, we're going to get into some of the questions that we have from the audience and, and Let's start with this. There are always hot button issues in any offseason, so let's jump right in. And Tom, I'll start with you. In Dominican Sue, uh, you're trying to negotiate a, a long term deal with him. He's got another year on his contract. Uh, these negotiations, they've been talked about a lot. Are they any different, any more acrimonious than the other contract negotiations that you go through on a normal basis? Not at all. As a matter of fact, I, I'd probably say they're, they're more on the civil and productive side of the spectrum when it comes to hostile versus, you know, versus, I don't know what the opposite of that is, but there, there's not much of that in, in negotiating. It's usually on the hostile side. But in, in this case, uh, not at all. I think, um, you know, Dominican is a very intelligent guy, very thoughtful. Um, he took his time selecting a, a new representative. Um, he ended up selecting Jimmy Sexton, who is a very accomplished um, agent in his own right represents a, a lot of players around the NFL. Somebody that I've had a relationship with for uh, for a couple of decades now. So 
I, I have a lot of confidence in Jimmy. I have a lot of confidence in Indomitian. Um, you know, I, I've said a few times, it's been my experience over the years that when a player says he wants to be here and we indicate that we want to keep him around, uh, we have a good track record of, of finding success. When that happens, uh, it, it, I don't know. And it doesn't really matter. The timing is less important than the outcome. And as long as the outcome is right, uh, both for, for Indomitian and for us, uh, then I think he can be a part of the core of our team for a long time. Coach, he, he's not here right now. And I know you've been asked about this, but as a team captain and as a player that will be heavily counted on by this football team, your take on the fact that he has not come into a voluntary work yet? Well, you, you know, the rules are uh, exactly what they say they are, they're voluntary. Uh, you know, so obviously, but from a coaching standpoint, I mean, obviously we do this for a living. Uh, and uh, we'd like to have him every minute of every day, every single player, as often as we possibly can, just to get our system in place and all those kinds of things. But here's the thing. He's a very, very thoughtful individual who's kind of got his life extremely planned out. Uh, we talked. As a matter of fact, I probably talked to him more than any other player from the time that I got the job until now he was in the office more than anybody else. And so you had a real good sense of what his plan was going to be. Um, but nevertheless, I, I think he's still going to see him have a very, very positive impact on our team. To that end, let me come to the defensive coordinator and just talk for a second about the fact that this contract, not trying to pave the road for Tom, will be a big contract. What does a guy like this, a defensive tackle, mean to the defense you're trying to put together? Well, I think when you have a guy that can disrupt the middle, uh, create pressure on the passer, and do some good things in the run game, uh, it, it's really good. Uh, and you can move him around, you can do some different things, and exploit some matchups inside. And I think uh, those type of guys, anytime you have a football player that's, that can disrupt the offense and cause havoc, then you, he's worth every penny you're paying, whatever that price may be. So we're just looking forward to getting back and getting here and doing things great. Let me come to you, Shell, because I have a question here about uh, what position you're leaning towards drafting. I know you're not giving me that, so I won't even go there. But let me say this, just a general feeling on the draft, but further, it seems in free agency, that you have been able to go out, sign a veteran corner, a couple of them to be exact, sign a veteran safety, bring Brandon Pettigrew back, sign a wide receiver. It seems like you've answered a lot of the questions in free agency to where going into the draft, you have some flexibility and there's not that screaming need that you absolutely have to address. Yes, that's true. And, and part of our plan is, uh, is evaluating players as a, a year-round deal. So, I mean, it, you can start off with Reggie Bush last year, you get him in free agency. Prior to that, you got Drake Bell, two guys that had a, a ton of success for us last year. So you're grinding out throughout the entire year. You're signing C.J. Mosley. You know, we signed Jeremy Ross through the course of the year last year, helped us score a couple touchdowns and did some of those things. So the evaluation period is an entire year process. We continue on there. We get prepared for the draft. Obviously, I won't tell you who we're drafting, but I can tell you we're going to be drafting a player that's going to be of high integrity, a guy with a high motor and a guy that finishes well. You know, every every game, Tom and Juan and I will come down in the fourth quarter of the game. We're working up in the press box there. We come down to the sideline and we want to get a feel for what's going on with everyone in the stands. So we're going to be there right with Jim when we finish up each game. And so you see the positives, you see the negatives. But with that, you also saw six games out of seven where we did not finish. So we're going to be looking for closers this year. We look for them in free agency, guys that have been there, guys that are coaching staff that have been there, guys that will not quit and need some more and have some kind of additional players that have that same kind of mindset. So that's what we're looking for, and that's what we've done so far. And we still have a lot of work to do. It won't end ever. We're always looking for a better player. We're up to 90 this year for our roster, and we'll attempt to find the 91st player that's better than 90 and replace him so we can continue to improve our product, which we've done since 2008. Along those lines, Jim, as we, as we slide down to you, that's something that Mark Mayhew talked about after last season. Is one of the critical things that you have to do in building a team is find that difference maker, find a guy in the fourth quarter that can change a game, and that's ultimately what you're looking for. And you don't always know where you're going to find them. Sometimes they can come from unexpected places. Well, there's no question about it. I mean, in, in some cases, they're developed along the way. You know, obviously, I, I think our personnel office they do a tremendous job of, of finding guys that fit our system, and uh, and I think that's that's important. Uh, because they got to fit in a number of different ways. It's not just simply a talent factor, because obviously that makes a huge difference, but it's also a character factor. 
It's also a commitment factor. It's also being able to gel with your teammates and create the kind of chemistry that you need in order to win. Winning not just a byproduct of a bunch of talented guys running around on the football field, you know. You have to have young men that are dedicated to the cause, that come together, and obviously that, that determination and, and that grit that you're looking for obviously will help a team gel and overcome anything that they face. Joe, let me come down to you. And, you know, oftentimes when you get a job, you walk into a situation where you look around and there may not be a lot of talent. Uh, you remarked when you walked in the door for the first time met with the media, this is a nice opportunity because there are a lot of pieces in place. You've added another one at Golden Tate. Just talk about how you viewed this opportunity in Detroit and what you've found since you've been here. I think of all the uh, possible jobs that were open, this was certainly the uh, roster that had the most talent. I'm very excited about the quarterback. I'm, I'm familiar with the running backs because they both came from New Orleans, and so I know what they're capable of. Calvin, you know, his, his talent speaks for itself, and, and I'm very excited about Golden Tate. And then you've got a solid tight end core, and uh, you know the offensive line played really well last year. They're really well coached by uh, Jeremiah Washburn, and uh, you know there's not there's not really a lot of holes to talk about. So uh, it's been fun seeing them here these last couple weeks, and uh, hit the hit the field next week, and, and really see how we can fit the system to the talent we have. Absolutely, Bono. Let's come down to you. You certainly you're back this year, your second year with the Lions, and last year there was a step up in, in most every category in special teams. Just talk about some of the things that you look back on that you were pleased with last year and what your thought process was as you hit the offseason. Well, the number one thing we need to do is find a kicker. Uh, <laughs> I haven't said that very often in Detroit for the last uh, 35, 40 years. Uh, we, we found a, a great young punter in Sam Martin last year, and he did a tremendous job for us. But, with that core group of guys, I mean, you're always looking for the next upcoming young player. Uh, we try to tell them, it's like, how can we trust you to play on offense and defense if you can't play on special teams? And so there's an attitude that comes along with that uh, that's part of our culture. And we say that we're going to always chase perfection. And we're going to chase it relentlessly. And uh, Excellence is just not some place you pull up and park and you all of a sudden become as excellent. It's a process. It's how you do things every day, day in and day out. And, uh, you know, we always want to be on the rise. So where we were yesterday is not going to be where we're going to be tomorrow. We want to come out and be better every single time. We can take the field, whether it's a practice, preseason game, regular season game, and this year in the postseason. Tom, one of the um, significant things that happened in this offseason was the unfortunate loss of, of Mr. Ford. Just talk for a minute about the impact that he had on you. What, what stands out when you think of him? And Obviously, it appears that he has things in place that, uh, well, obviously that's an awful thing to happen in the past. He had in place people that will keep this organization moving in the direction that he wanted it to move. There's no question. I think uh, the thing that stands out most about Mr. Ford was his commitment to his family, his commitment to his franchise, his commitment to the city, and his commitment to Ford Motor Company. Um, and, and those were the things that always stood out about him. He was never an owner, as all of you know, who was out front. He was never the guy that was gonna try and take the spotlight. He was never the guy that was gonna make a lot of noise. But I can tell you that, that there was no owner, and I've been around uh, the 31 other owners in the league, there's a lot of great ones, but nobody wanted to win any more than Mr. Ford did. Um, and, and he, that burning desire to win was really, really special. He didn't get there in his lifetime, and there's nothing more that I wanted to do and many in the organization wanted to do than to win that Lombardi Trophy for him. Um, now we have a chance to do that in his memory, and there's nothing more special than, uh, than doing that if we could raise that trophy in his honor this February. But you know, now his wife, Mrs. Ford, is our, is our principal owner. Uh, Bill Ford Jr., obviously, who many of you have seen, uh, is a tremendous leader in his own right. He's done some phenomenal things at Ford Motor Company. He continues as our vice chairman uh, and, uh, and, and the rest of his family. And keep in mind, these are, these are children of Mr. Ford who grew up with the Lions. They, they don't know anything but Lions football on Sunday afternoon from the time they were this tall uh, through adulthood. Their passion, they talk about bleeding Honolulu blue, the, there is no doubt that that runs through their veins. And uh, uh, we're looking forward to the energy and the support 
and the commitment that they're bringing and the accountability uh, that they're going to hold us to. They're, they're going to hold us to some high standards, and we expect that and look forward to it. And, uh, and all of you should, too, because those are standards that I think uh, all of you would appreciate as well. And they, uh, <coughs> those are standards that uh, begin and end in February. Hey, Shelton, uh, let me ask. Absolutely. Your approach to free agency this year, what was the template for the type of guy that you were looking for as you guys started that process? Uh, before I answer that, I want to continue on with a little bit of Mr. Ford, the way I remembered him. Um, one of the biggest moments always for us is after the end of the game when we've won. And every year he comes out in that locker room, he's high-fiving, he's talking to the media, he's talking to the players, he's shaking hands. And you can see over the course of time, every year, a little bit slower, a little bit slower, last year in a wheelchair. We know that guy's going to be with us next year. He's going to be in that locker room with us when we win these games. So the type of people we were mentioned, I mentioned it earlier, we're looking for closers. We're looking for guys that are, that are, um, that have a, a great ability to finish games. Um, but prior to that, before we even pick players for our team, we need to know our team in depth. So throughout the course of the entire season, we evaluate our own team. I'm in constant step with Tom, Martin, and Jim will be, we'll, we'll be evaluating these players. We'll have to know our own team before we can add to our team and add to that locker room. We need to know what we need in that locker room. So we have a ton of meetings. And they're going to all come to my office. They did during free agency. I run the free agency meetings. We get through all that part of it. We're going to do the same thing starting tomorrow with the draft meetings. We're looking for players that can finish, close, high integrity type players. And part of your job, your job is that when free agency hit, you weren't going to work on these players. For the most part, the work was already done and in place that you had a uh, bio and, and an opinion on these guys before they even hit the market. That is true, and, and what's also really important too is that you mentioned the players that we have. A few years ago, we, when we were begging for players, and we had to overpay for guys to come. Now you look at our locker room, you got Matthew Stafford, you got Calvin Johnson, you got Indominic and Sue. Reggie Bush, it was an easy sell for us. He saw exactly how he fit and around all the players that were around him. So we have some pieces in place. We need to continue adding and getting better. But you, you have players now that in a, in a city that everyone wants to come to play. They want to play with us. So it's, it's not as hard of a sell as it was a few years ago. And uh, we have to continue to build on those players. I think one of the cool things, and Coach, you touched on this a little bit earlier in terms of bringing in guys that are winners. Uh, you look at a couple of the guys that you brought in. They've won Super Bowls in the past couple of years. And that has to be a nice addition to a locker room. And a guy like Ahedebo and a guy like Tate, guys that have been to the absolute pinnacle in the National Football League, and now you've put them in your locker room. Well, I think that's an extremely important factor. Um, I think it's important with your staff. You know, obviously Joe and Terrell both have had uh, Super Bowl experience and won Super Bowls and know what it, it takes. But also it um, helps when you have players that understand as well. Because it's not easy. You know, oftentimes people think you just roll the ball out there and, and start playing and fight your way to a championship. It's tough. There are going to be some ups and downs. There are going to be a lot of difficult times, and they're going to have to hang in there together. This National Football League, I mean, this is the best of the best. This is an elite group of individuals, and every single team has great players. So you're not just going to waltz in and win it all. You're going to have to fight your way through it. You're going to have to take all right, your opportunity and do something with it. And I think guys that have been there, like Golden Tate's been there, uh, James has been there, Dig has been there, obviously with us uh, in Baltimore. He certainly had some experience in New England as well. So as many guys as you could possibly get uh, on your squad that fit uh, and have that experience, it's invaluable. So let me come down to you. And, and uh, They say in Detroit that the two most scrutinized guys are Lions quarterback and the Red Wings goalie. Well, you inherited one of those guys at Matthew Stafford. And he met with the media last week and talked about the fact that, yeah, he's working and he knows he has to get better. Your thoughts is, as you studied him in taking the job and now as you begin to work side by side with him a little bit? I, th I think as you watch him on film, the first thing that jumps off is his talent. He's got incredible arm talent. Um, he's got enough athleticism. And he, for the most part, I think he makes pretty good decisions. Um, I've gotten more excited as I've worked with him here the last couple of weeks. He is uh, a gym rat. He's smart. He wants to be good. And, and you can see it in the meeting rooms how hard he studies, the questions that he asks, that uh, this game's very important to him, and, and the Lions are very important to him. And being successful for this team is very important to him. And so when you add talent to smarts, to work ethic, I, I think that's just an equation for success. 
you know, Dan, let me, let me add something to that, too. I, this doesn't just apply to Matthew, but it applies to every guy on our roster. Um, the question was asked earlier about Adamican being here. And, you know, I, I have no doubt that Adamican is training hard. He actually brought his trainers from uh, Oregon in to meet with us, to let us know what his program was in the offseason, not just during this period of time, but the entire offseason. But when you talk about a player being able to be prepared to be the best he possibly can be, I am a firm believer that the absolute best place in the country, in the world, to get better as a Detroit Lion is 222 Republic Drive in Allen Park, Michigan. In that practice facility, Monday through Friday, with this group of men and their staff, they are the best, of, Jim said, the best of the best in the National Football League when it comes to performance on the field with the athletes. Well, the best of the best at what they do in the coaching ranks, too. And you talk about quarterback gurus or people learn, teaching Matthew how to you know, improve his mechanics or his footwork, what have you. We have the best of the best. There ought to be no voices better that he can hear than Jim Caldwell, Joe Lombardi, Jim Bob Cooter, and the like in Allen Park. No, Terrell, uh, if you look at the defense that you're inheriting and you look at the numbers from last year, you look at against the run, you look at third down, you look at red zone, some really good numbers. But there were critical times where the defense wasn't able to come up with the plays that they needed to seal the game at the end. How do you take a defense that by the numbers did some good things and cross that bridge to the point where you say that's a difference-making defense? Well, I think what you do is uh, you know what you do well. Okay, so you continue to work on that, you continue to improve. But I think the areas that you struggle in, uh, what you do is you take those and you find situations throughout the course of the season in practice to work on, to put the players in that situation so when it happens in a game, it's not unfamiliar to them. They don't feel, uh oh, I better not, you know, they feel undecided on whether I can make this play or not. They're confident, they're comfortable, they know their assignment, and they've been in that situation many, many times. Obviously not the game, but that's that's our job. So what we would do, when we, wherever I've been, uh, if you have a problem in an area, one year we had a, a situation where we weren't very good in two minutes, getting off the field, stopping people. And so what we did is we, we just did two minute after two minute after two minute, and we'd end practice with that. And it became competitive because our guys knew, hey, this is the difference between winning and losing. And the bottom line in this league is it's not about stats. The only stat that counts is if you win or if you lose. And so you can put stats up there and you can twist stats around and you can do whatever you want with it. But the bottom line is at the end of the year, how many wins do you have? How many losses do you have? Did you make the playoffs? Did you give yourself a chance to win, to win it all? You know, I think, talk about difference makers, I think one guy that emerged for you that I think fans are excited to see what he's going to do this time around is Jeremy Ross. Uh, he's a guy that kind of came out of nowhere, and all of a sudden he, he becomes one of the more dangerous return men that we saw in the second half of the season last year. Just your thoughts on his progression and what you're looking for, for him to get even better as we come into this season. Well, um, first of all, when I think of Jeremy, I think of we're hungry. Um, he came here, you know, was released by Green Bay, and he was very, very hungry to uh, prove himself. And when his opportunity came, he was prepared. Um, it'll be exciting this year to see what he can do having a full off-season with us, a full training camp, preseason, where he can actually uh, we can in integrate him into our system from day one. Um, you know, he came in really and was kind of flying on automatic pilot, did a very good job. He sees the field very well. He can always improve at, on field and the ball, things of those things. But he is a powerful runner. And, uh, I'm really glad we have him, and I'm excited to keep working with him. Would you get a guy like that that shows that he can return kicks and maybe more specifically return punts? It's a guy you want to work with, right? Because it's it's a different job back there. It takes kind of a different cat to be willing to stand back there with everybody running full speed at him and accept that and excel at that. There is no question. It is, uh, returning punts in the National Football League is probably one of the harder jobs in sports period. It does take a very unique mindset. Um, you know, I'm just really happy to have Jeremy. And, uh, you know, he did a very good job. He hits things, and, you know, he's just a hard, a hard man to bring back. Tom, a lot of talk about uh, salary cap. It's one of the hot button issues in the National Football League now. and. Uh, there's a perception Lions are up against the cap, no room left, and that's where sometimes the Adamic and Sue talk came in. So let me present this to you. 
somebody calls you tomorrow and says, here's a trade that you can make or here's a move that you can make and you don't necessarily have the cap room to make it, are there mechanisms in place where if there's something this football team wants to do, you can find the cap money to do it? Yes. Um, <laughs> next question. <laughs> you know, it really comes down to um, how that player or that opportunity, that move, plays into the immediate term and the long term. So if there's something that somebody presents to us, whether it's a trade in the draft, whether it's a player who gets released that we might not expect, all those things Sheldon was talking about. And I think it's important. I mean, I, Sheldon kind of... Now, but we're finding players, they're finding them all the time. You know, you added, uh, we talked about Jeremy Ross just now. I think we had in the middle of the season, a few years back, those of you who have been with us a while remember when, and this was one of Shelton's first ones, added Desmond Howard in the middle of the season. He shows up on a Friday, on Sunday, he's returning a punt for a touchdown. Um, I mean, th th this is an ongoing process, but you can't let the salary cap be an artificial inhibitor of those kinds of decisions. It is a governor. Every team is subject to the salary cap. It, it is an equalizer around the 32 clubs. That's why the NFL is such a competitive league. But at the same time, you have to manage it with an eye towards the present and one towards the future. So if you have that nucleus of players, it's not paying players a lot of money. It's making sure that the players you play a lot of, pay a lot of money to play well. And uh, if guys like Matthew Stafford, Calvin Johnson, maybe Adam <coughs> uh those guys, if they're the, the, the leaders of the franchise on the field and in the locker room, then we've done our job. We've got that core. And that's not a different structure than you see from a lot of teams around the uh, NFL. Sheldon, in terms of one of the things that's really blown up in football are these pro days. We used to hear about them. Now they're televised live. And I know you spend most of your time with pro personnel, but I know you're also involved in all the valuations. Just talk about how you measure these pro days, which get so much chatter. And it seems like if you listen to the talking heads on TV, a guy's career could be made or broken on one of these days. Just how you you work that into an evaluation when you also have three or four years of tape. Before I even go there, um, I evaluated our cap situation prior to coming here. And he just told me he needs some more room, so I got a couple more players that we like to add. <laughs> okay, you got an audience out here that's all right with that. <laughs> right, uh, uh, really, the uh, the evaluation of these pro days, and, and when I came out in 1988. The pro day was essentially go to the combine and do exactly what everyone tells you to do, which was everything. There was no, okay, I'm waiting to run the 40-yard dash on my pro day. Anytime a coach called, you were there. Terrell was part of that process. We didn't know what time it was. It could a phone call at 9 or 10 o'clock at night, and the guy would tell you he's being, he'll be there tomorrow morning, and he's on his way to Cincinnati from Miami, Ohio, in a couple hours. So you had to be prepared for all of that. Um, it's really kind of warped into a... Um, uh, a huge deal now. I'm elbowing people away at the University of Missouri this year. The, the cameraman, there's just so many people there. Um, but the reality of the pro day is the, the majority of your evaluations are already in. This is more like a, a confirmation. Okay, I look at this guy on tape. I've been evaluating for years. First off, he can play. Hey, the, the pro day is not going to change that. The guy can play. I think he can run, but I'm not quite sure. Who's he going against? So you're trying to evaluate some of these college guys. Is the guy is, is the guy is going against is that the first round he's going against, or is that the guy who's going to be selling insurance next year? We don't know. Sometimes, you know, so you're evaluating them I mean, and you're trying to get a number and evaluate. Against any insurance salesman out there? <laughs> no, nothing at all. But, however, <laughs> point being is, if Shelton signs a lot of insurance salesmen. He'll be sitting out there with you guys. <laughs> the point is, is the guy an NFL player or not that he's going against? So you're trying to evaluate that player. I think he can run. You go to the pre day confirmation. Or I'm not sure this guy can run. Oh, yep, yeah, he's a he's a corner. He just ran a 4.75. That's a confirmation for us. We also have a lot of friends around the league. I went to the Michigan State workout. I knew half of the coaching staff. So we've already done all the evaluations. We already have all that information. And now let me go talk to this coach, not just on the phone, but a one-on-one. -on -one. Take him out to lunch or whatever. And just really kind of get some more insight and vision on who this player is. How is he in the locker room? How is he in your meeting rooms? What's his work ethic like? and trying to find the best player for the Detroit Lions. This is what we're trying to do. You know, Jim, I have a bunch of questions here about how you're going to handle the win now, attitude of the organization, what does Detroit mean to you, what are you going to do to, to bring a winner? You get the sense, and I'm sure if you've been out there, you understand the hunger of this fan base to win. What does that mean to you, and what kind of impact does that mean? 
First of all, I think it's great. Um, I, I think uh, the passion of the fans is quite evident. Um, I, every place I've gone, I've been to some, certainly a number of activities throughout the city, doing some community service and things of that nature, or I happen to be walking through a mall or something with my wife, I can tell that these fans want to win, you know, and they want to win in a hurry, right? Uh, but that's a good thing, because I think that type of passion is so much better than apathy. Um, you know, when you look at apathy, obviously, um, you certainly don't want a fan base that, that's based upon the, uh, that particular emotion. Um, this one, and, and you know, having an opportunity to come and play in this stadium um, and, and get a sense of how passionate this fan base is, was really exciting, obviously, for us to have an opportunity to come and be part of it. And that passion, I think, is extremely important. Um, if you carry that on, because this is also a very knowledgeable fan base. You know, there are some places in the National Football League that you can go and the fans really don't know when to cheer, right? Um, this fan base <laughs> is very, very bright, right? And, and understands how to sort of be a thorn in the side of the opposition. So, so I think that, that, that healthy enthusiasm is great. And it's our job to win. Uh, you know, there's not been a situation in my life, I've been coaching almost 40 years now, that I've ever been able to walk into a stadium or into a, a meeting room and felt that, you know what, we got it made, we don't have to win this year. No, you got to win all the time, and you have to win right now. Yeah, because... You were on that sideline trying to run an offense on a Monday night, so you experienced what this house can be like, and all these Monday nights are fantastic, but when this place is full, it doesn't matter. It's great all the time. It's something Tom touched on. These people are a weapon you need. Absolutely. I mean, every single one of you. There was a few of you I told when I was shaking your hands up there, we need you to be nice and loud. We need you to give that opposition a real problem particularly their quarterback, snap, count, things of that nature. We need you right in the middle of it because it is such a weapon. Obviously, when we came in here and played, matter of fact, um, you know, we had several, a couple of plays we tried to audible at the line of scrimmage. Uh, the wide receiver didn't hear the call. Uh, the, the, the right tackle was a little bit off and really thwarted a, a play that I thought was going to be pretty good, actually. Uh, but nevertheless, <laughs> uh, the noise, the crowd was so loud that uh, it, it gave us some problems, and, and we hope you'll do the same thing, obviously, this fall. You guys thwarted that play, and then they kicked the 61 yard field goal. <laughs> but, uh, and I'll tell you, just one note on that, too, just so not to talk out of school for coaches' uh, team meetings, but he had that introductory team meeting a week ago today when the players came back. And just so you don't think he's telling you guys what you want to hear, telling us what he wants to hear, uh, he put up some slides uh, talking to the players about what his expectations were for this year. And the slide came up and said, win and win now. It wasn't down the road, it wasn't we're going to build something, we're going to install our systems, but it was win and win now. What those expectations were and are in terms of uh, winning a division title, making the playoffs and giving, as Terrell said a minute ago, a chance to do some things uh, positively in the playoffs and play deep into the playoffs, that's our goal this year, uh, not down the road sometime. Is that a process, Coach? Let me stick with you for a second, that you do have a lot of guys in this locker room that have never won a playoff game, that have never won big in this league. Is there a process to teaching them how to win, or is it teaching them how to play football that the winning comes? Well, here's the thing that I think oftentimes is discounted. The most important thing about football is you have to be really sound and good at your fundamentals. You have to be brilliant at the basics. That's the key. It's a simple game in that sense, but very, very hard to do, to do those techniques and fundamentals over and over and over again. Some of these guys sitting here on this front row know exactly what I'm talking about because they, they were, that's how they were, were brought up in this game. They, you know, the, the, you know, worried about being fancy and this thing and that and, and looking good and all that kind of stuff. Um, complexity of plays, you know, it really boils down to whether or not you can block, you can tackle, right? Whether you can catch, whether you can throw it accurately. The, all of the basic things are the things that are going to make a difference for you. I mean, that's how you put together winning streaks. That's how you win games. That's how you win series. To put it in the end zone, that's how you get yourself in the playoffs and have an opportunity to win it all. Absolutely. Hey, Joe, if somebody who was qualified to do so was to look at it this team in November or October, didn't know you were here, would they see a lot of the Saints system in, in what you're going to be bringing to Detroit? I think there will be some elements, but... Uh, you know, Coach Caldwell always talks about using the intellectual property that you have acted. Is that okay? No, you're good. Um, the intellectual property. Somebody up there didn't like the answer. That you have access to. And 
Well, the offensive coaching staff is, is a pretty impressive group, and, and so you're going to see elements of the Colts and, and uh, the Ravens that uh, Coach Caldwell knew. Um, there are some things that they did here last year that I think are really good that, that we're going to keep in the system. Um, and then you've got Ron Prince and things that he did at Rutgers and Robert Prince and things that he did at Boise State. And so we're going to borrow and steal from all those different uh, systems. And, and really, in November, you're going to see a Lions offense. And I think if you just look at it very quickly and you say Drew Brees and you say Peyton Manning and you say Joe Flacco, it's a lot of intellectual property that you guys have worked with over the years that you can certainly bring to this system and other talented players as well. Absolutely. I mean, those. the great thing about working with great players is you learn as much or more from them uh, as a coach than maybe you give them. And so some of those habits, some of those routines that those great players use, you can try to show Matthew and, and the other players uh, some of the things that, that help make those players great. And, and they can take that information and fit it to their own personality, their own style of play. Terrell, I had a uh, question here about defensive backs. Obviously, you've come to Detroit as a coordinator, but you've spent a great deal of time as a secondary coach. Uh, quarterback was a was a position where there were some problems last year. Do you anticipate yourself spending a lot of time with them? Because you also have a lot of young players at that position that are still developing in this league. You know, I'll, I'll be looking over everybody. We've hired two quality guys to, to work in the secondary. Uh, Tony Oden and Alan Williams, both of them uh, have won at the highest level. They develop secondaries, they develop groups. And so I'm going to let those guys coach their guys, and they're going to do a great job with them. I think the best thing we can do is, again, put them in situations, keep stressing them in practice so they continue. We, we, we shine them up, you know, we sharpen them, and we get them ready to go. And, and those guys will do a great job with the, with the young corners. I would have to think, too, that your evaluation of those young corners, guys like Slay and Greenwood and Green and Bentley, you, your evaluation of them goes into what you tried to accomplish during this offseason. Just as, a, as an overhead, a lot of those guys haven't played a lot. They've had injuries or, or were ineffective and they were in and out of the lineup. What have you seen from them that tells you where they're headed in the national football? Well, I think a lot of it is uh, they've all been in, uh, they're working really hard in the classroom right now. And I think next week we'll get a better sense of where we are. And I think like anything, we, part of our deal as coaching is We'd like to do a lot of things, but we have to do what our players can do. And if we're not doing what they can do, then we're doing them a disservice. So we're going to get out and we're going to work things and we'll keep moving and molding and, and figuring out what we exactly we can do. And by the time we get through OTAs, we'll know exactly where we are, what we can do with our guys, and where we're going during the season. You know, it's interesting in here, talking to Joe and in talking to Terrell. Uh, I, I can look at them and I have a pretty good idea of what guys they're going to have on the field. As I kind of went over what I wanted to talk about tonight, I started thinking about you. And, and John, you might have, special teams coordinators might have, in that regard, one of the toughest jobs in the NFL because your personnel is constantly changing year to year, even week to week from time to time as guys get moved in and out of the lineup. How do you approach that? And, and I would assume that at that point, it really just comes back to you leaning more on a system and guys fitting into that system. Well, yes, th that's part of it. And you really start by by training your whole teams from day one uh, to fill various roles. But every personnel move that's made is going to affect the kicking game. Uh, backup becomes a starter. It was starting on a lot of special teams. Obviously, his role on special teams would be uh, reduced because he's playing more offense or defense. So, um, you know, the name of the game is adjust. You know, all of us that do this, we know what we signed up for. It's part of our job, and, you know, you just – uh, you're constantly evaluating the players and where, what roles they can fit um, with different units. And uh, you do your best that you can to train them and get them ready to go so that when they get the field, they're confident and they can perform. Absolutely. I know one of the things, Tom, that you spend a lot of time on, and uh, there were a lot of changes last year in terms of the fan experience here at Ford Field. And these are the ones that are experiencing it from week to week. Just some of the things that you're excited about as they make their way back into Ford Field come August. Well, I, you know, I always say this when we talk about fan experience. The, the, the best experience we can give you is a win, period. Amen. So that's, that's really what we, what we begin with from that standpoint. And I'm, I couldn't be more excited about the staff, uh, guys you've heard from tonight, guys who are back in Allen Park. I mean, it's an incredibly talented staff. One thing I should mention, uh, 
you know, Joe touched on it with the with the offensive staff, but but Terrell's got the same dynamics on the defensive staff. You know, we have on our defensive staff uh, two guys who have been coordinators in the NFL. On our offensive staff, we have a couple guys who have been coordinators in the NFL and a couple guys who have been coordinators in college. So we have a tremendous amount of intellectual capital. Uh, and while you know Joe said it. Uh, if you if you take one idea, it's stealing. If you take a lot of them, it's research. So we've got a lot of research that we've been doing on the uh, on the on the uh, uh, offensive and defensive sides of the ball to give you guys that fan experience of wins on Sundays. But you know, I think the the, the next best thing we can do after that is make sure that you have a great day at Ford Field, um, no, no matter what the outcome of the game. And that it takes us looking at it from start to finish, from the time people are driving down 75. What can we do to make that exit on Madison better? What can we do to make the line shorter? And, and we have a great, great team off the field as well. We're bragging on our coaching staff a little bit, but our, a lot of our staff is here tonight, and, and I really want to thank them from Lou Perez and Elizabeth Parkinson, Jennifer Catacamo, Bill Keenis, uh, and their teams who have done just so much to really try and improve our experience, the experience of our fans. And so you saw a little bit tonight with experimenting with a little bit of our, our paperless ticketing. We know we need to improve Wi-Fi. We, we need to shorten the concession lines. And then we need to tie everything together so that when you're when you're experiencing the game, again, from the time the players walk out of the tunnel to the time the, uh, the clock strikes zero, we've got a theme. We've got an opportunity for you to interact, an opportunity for you to feel like the investment that you're making is not only worth it for the product that's on the field, but for the experience that you're having off the field. Sheldon, let, let me, uh, I have a question here about what's the greatest need in the draft. And again, I know if you're playing it close to the best, you probably won't go deep into depth on that. But take us inside that room because so much of your work is done before draft day. I think a lot of times when we think of the draft room, we think of your pick comes up and there's a, a lot of chatter. What are we going to do here? Much of that work is done before that day even comes to the point where your board is set up. When your pick comes, it's a pretty quick process, isn't it? Yeah, what we need uh, initially is good players. But we need a lot of good players. So um, I look up, I see Lombardi right there. I love when he's around. Charlie Sanders works for me. Those guys are around our building all the time. I love for our players to be able to see those guys. I want Calvin Johnson to see Lombardi and Charlie Sanders. That's what he should be when he's done. So what we're looking for is good players. But like I mentioned earlier, we're going to start our draft meeting starting tomorrow. You know, we've already been through a ton of work and evaluations. We've already have a preliminary board that we have set up, all those things. And now we're going to go back into my office tomorrow, and we're not coming out until draft day, with the exception of Easter. Um, so what we're going to do at that time is we're just going to grind it out. By, and you're absolutely right. By the time draft day comes, we should have went through every scenario where it's just picking guys off the board. There's not a lot of stress in our draft room usually. Because all the work's been done, all the scenarios, all the mock drafts, all those things are already have already been completed prior to. So when it comes time to pick our make our pick, pick at ten, if we stay there or we go up or down, wherever it is, we have a list of players that we know that we've already targeted and we know exactly what we're going to do that at that time. And it's a pretty seamless process at that point. Coach, your, your thoughts on the draft? Um, and I know you come in at this point. You've got a lot of things going on in terms of. A, putting a coaching staff together, putting playbooks together, getting players acclimated to the way that you want to do things. At this point, do you turn a lot of your focus towards the draft and getting ready for it? Well, we, we try and do a little bit of both because of the fact that obviously we're trying to get our team ready to play as well. So um, just as you mentioned, um, there's a lot that goes into it from a technical start side of looking at it. Um, you, know, you know, all the fundamentals and techniques that we're going to be teaching schematically, what we're looking at. Uh, but then also we're working every afternoon a little bit on situational football also. We talk through situations, the entire staff, and, uh, and come up with the best approach to handle every single conceivable situation we can possibly think of during this time of the year. We try to grind it out. And, uh, and then, besides that, we're also evaluating, obviously, for the assistant coaches, it's by position for the coordinators, they evaluate the entire side of the ball. Um, so John's got a lot of film to watch, Terrell does as well, and so does Joe. And then as a head coach, I look at both sides of the ball and the kicking game. So, so there is a lot of film study to do as well. Sounds like, much like Sheldon, you guys aren't going home a whole lot these days either. There's a lot of long hours and a lot of long days. That's just the nature of our business. I mean, that's, that's just the way it is. I mean, we, we love what we do. Um, we have a great passion for what we do. 
Um, so we have a lot of fun. I mean, you know, to have an opportunity to sit in that film room and, and try to find that diamond in the rough. I mean, oftentimes nowadays, the way in which all the teams scour through film, you don't find very many sleepers these days. I mean, they find them under a rock. But nevertheless, I think you find some that fits your system a little bit better than others, and that's what you're looking for, that guy that can come in and make a huge difference. I want to hit a couple of you with this, because I had a question here. Uh, now that you come in as the head coach of the Lions, uh, you come in as the head coach of a team that will play every Thanksgiving day. What does that tradition mean to you as you look ahead to your first as a head coach here in Detroit? Well, looking forward to it. I, you know, I've had the, the great fortune of, of playing on a couple of uh, Thanksgiving days, uh, and, excuse me, Thanksgiving Day games, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, it's a special time. It's a great tradition. I remember growing up as a kid in Beloit, Wisconsin, having an opportunity to watch some of those Thanksgiving Day games, and you always look for the Lions on Thanksgiving Day. And, uh, you know, and we're looking forward to, to doing that as well. It's a great tradition, uh, and, uh, and, and we're going to add to that on Thanksgiving Day a tradition of winning that game as well. That's important. You know, for you guys who have all spent time in Michigan, it's a return, and now you get to be even more a part of that tradition, Joe. Yeah, I'm excited. I've got uh, a bunch of kids, so it's going to be nice to know that I'm always going to be home Thanksgiving dinner. That's, uh, that's a big part of it for me. So it'll be... Uh, like, like coach, I've been a part of some of those games, but it's always been on the road. So uh, I know it's, it's going to be a tradition that uh, I'm sure we'll have family from other parts of the country come in and be part of that. So uh, it'll be something. I had a question about the utilization of Reggie Bush and Joy Bell and how you plan on utilizing two guys that were a very big part of what this team did last year. Yeah, I think, um, you know, they both have their specific role. And, um, you know, again, I'm familiar with them, but it's been a few years since I've been with Reggie. And, and I think a lot of that stuff defines itself as you get out on the practice field and you really see how they're fitting into the system. But, you know, this game, it's a violent game anymore, and it's hard for one running back to get all the carry. So much like they did last year, I see these guys kind of uh, having a split role and both being very productive. There's also Michael yeah, LaShore, so and, and I'm sure your mind, we talk about Bush and we talk about Bell, I'm sure your mind is open to anybody that shows you that they can be a productive member of this offense. Absolutely. I think that's, as, as much as we are installing schemes here over the next uh, few weeks and then in the uh, in training camp, a big part of it is finding your best 53 players to make your team and, 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 and to make your roster. And so... You know, Coach Caldwell told the team, everyone's got a clean slate. And so certainly we know some of these players from past experience or uh, from scouting them from other teams, but we're, everyone's got a clean slate, so they're all going to be uh, looked at and evaluated from this point forward. So, Terry, we talked about some of the young corners that you have on defense, and I think also there's a couple of young defensive ends that are people are getting excited about. We saw Ziggy last year. I think Devin Taylor at the end of the year was a guy that really took a big step up for this football team. Your thoughts on those guys? They could well be a big part of this thing for a long time on the outside of your defensive line. Yeah, you have two young guys at, uh, in terms of measurables. They, they're great-looking young men, and they're just going to continue to improve and get better. Uh, I think Devin came back uh, right now, and he's weighing a little bit more than he did last year, but he looks better. He looks leaner. Uh, and he, he really, uh, we're expecting some big things from him because a lot of guys, you know, once they learn, the NFL game's a little different than college. You, you know, a lot of guys can come in, and it takes a little while to adapt to the game because you're not playing young guys, you're playing men. And so as, as they grow, then you start to see some improvement. I think this offseason we'll see, see big improvement from uh, he and, and Ziggy. You're talking about uh, Ziggy. I remember evaluating Ziggy, and the big thing was, boy, he doesn't have much experience, he doesn't have this, but, boy, he's physically gifted. And what you saw towards the end of the year was a man, a physically gifted man, playing football. Now, if we can continue to improve, like Jim said, the basics, the fundamentals, the techniques, all of a sudden you're going to see that physically gifted man really, really uh, become a really good player. And, so, I, and I'm, we're excited. And it sounds like one of the things that you saw as you studied the tape of them was guys that were on the field who started to get it as the year went on. And there were probably specific examples of plays you saw them make late in the year that maybe they wouldn't have made early in the year. Right, and then you sometimes you just see them play late in the year. 
because of injuries. You have young guys sometimes they are playing backup roles. You don't see a whole lot. And all of a sudden, because it's a long season, they get thrown in the fire and they have to play. And then you see them flash. You see them do some good things. So you have those two guys. Darius Slay was another young guy. Same thing. He was kind of up and down. He was out, got back in, flashed. Chris Greenwood was another young guy, played at the end of the year. So we're anticipating all these young men, uh, you know, working hard, getting better at their craft, okay, and then coming out this year and showing improvement and continuing to grow. They're not done, not by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, so we've got a lot of upside with a lot of these young guys, and we're going to call on them to be good players for us and help us win. Bono, let me hit you on a couple of your specialists, uh, starting with Sam Martin. Lions drafted him. There were some people said, what the heck are they doing drafting a punter? Well, I think you saw last year, uh, there were a couple times we made mistakes that rookies make, but he was a guy that can change a game. He was a guy that we haven't seen around here in a while that can flip a field in the fourth quarter and change a game. Just your thought of what you saw from him in his first year. Well, he rewrote all the record for uh, punting. Uh, he owns all the single season records and he's the second all-time rookie punter in the history of the National Football League. So. He's pretty good, and I think with Sam, the sky's the limit. Uh, I think he's only starting to scratch the surface of what he's capable of. Um, he performed very well in three critical roles for us as a punter, also as a holder on, play, on uh, field goals, and then also as a kickoff man. So he's a young man that works very, very hard. I would expect this year to hit for him to improve in some of his situational punting, his directional stuff. But uh, I don't think we've seen anywhere near what he's capable of yet. You touched on the fact that you need a kicker. That's no small thing. That's a guy that you're going to trot out there to win a game for you, maybe several times during the season. Uh, is, is that one that stays on your mind a little bit more when you have an opening in a position like that where it can be such a big difference maker? Absolutely. It's, um, you know, from a scouting standpoint, it's our top priority in my department. Um, we have two guys on the roster right now that both have uh, some experience. Uh, the first one is a young man by the name of John Potter uh, from uh, Western Michigan. And uh, uh, John uh, uh, was drafted by the Buffalo Bills, was in their training camp, competed with Ryan Lundell. He's had regular season experience. Um, and, uh, you know, he's going to compete with Giorgio Trevecchio, who's also going to his third training camp. Uh, Giorgio's from Cal. He was in camp with the uh, with the Green Bay Packers last year and really gave uh, Mason Crosby a run for his money. So we'll evaluate those guys in this upcoming period and we'll compare them to the guys that are coming up uh, uh, in the draft, the draft eligible guys, and we'll find one. Tom, let me uh, last round of questions as we work our way through here, then we'll get some closing thoughts from you guys. Just the, the business of football, it, it seems to continue to grow. Uh, you know, it, it's, it seems to be just no limits to what the NFL is capable of doing, and it's nice to be involved in that business. Yeah, it is. But, you know, we have to be careful, too. Um, it's still about the game of football. And there's an old saying that, uh, you know, pigs get fat and hogs get slaughtered. And I, I think we have to be mindful of the fact that, uh, particularly in a place uh, like our city where, uh, the fans mean so much to us. We have to show them that respect back. And I'm, I'm a big fan of, of this expanded Thursday night football package that's coming on CBS this fall. Uh, but there's also a limit to how much we can be out there. And we want to make sure that it's a game that the people can enjoy. Uh, they can enjoy it in the way they want to enjoy it. So whether if we have to be smart about how we uh, let people uh, get, interact with our game in, uh, in the digital space. Um, a new product coming out this fall called NFL Now, which should be really interesting. Basically, the Lions on demand whenever you want them and, and, and news that's customized to your cell phone or your tablet. Uh, but at the same time, we have to be mindful of the fact that um, what grew this game into where it is now is a real sense of partnership amongst the owners, particularly in the 1960s, that said everybody should have access to football. We're still the only sport that it, it, it uh, is on broadcast television for every single game in a home market and in a participating market. Uh, so even when the game's on cable, we're in broadcast TV in those two participating markets. And we have to make sure that that access uh, stays available to all the fans and that we stay true to the fundamentals of the game. As Jim said earlier, that's what really the game is all about at its core. And we can't get caught up in the marketing and the glitz at the expense of those fundamentals. So tradition, balance with technology, 
I think it's the way to go as we grow this game. Uh, but it's all thanks to, to the support of the fans like you guys that allow us to do those kinds of things as a league that we're able to do. I'll throw this out collectively. There was a, anybody can confirm, deny, pass. There was a report this morning that the Lions were going to bring in Jadavian Clowney for a workout. Anybody? Yes. Take the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you along those lines, Mr. White. Uh, not, yeah, now it's you. It's not, I, I bailed you out a second ago. I don't uh, think you'd be a good gunner. <laughs> I mean. When the, the thought process is put into place, moving up in the draft, moving back in the draft, what are, because obviously there's been a lot of talk about Sammy Watkins, and when people mention Jadavia and Clowney, when people mention Jadavia and Clowney, that would certainly mean a move up in the draft, it would appear. What, what goes into that thought, obviously now and on draft day, as to whether or not something like that makes sense? First off, you have to decide and determine whether you have a player that fits what you, what you want. How many of those blue chip players are available ahead of you? You know, if we're picking at 10 and there's only seven of those guys, we may consider moving up to get that seventh guy. If there's 13 of them, we may move down to 13, but you better be able to count and make sure that whether you move up or down, you're picking a player that fits you and it has, it has exactly what you're looking for when you decide to put that jersey on because he's going to represent all of us. When, we, when he sits up there and holds the jersey up and Jim and Martin and Tom are standing right next to him smiling, he represents the Detroit Lions of this entire city. So we better make sure we know exactly what we're picking. The other thing is we have to consider our cap. You know, where are we in a cap? And not really how much we can spend. If it's a good player, we're going to go get him. But if it's not a good player, we don't want to spend that either. But just kind of determine where we are with our cap and how that guy fits in our structure with the rest of the players on our team. So uh, we'll like we'll take a look at it. Like I mentioned earlier, we'll evaluate every 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 scenario prior to, and then we'll have some decisions whether we want to entertain that or we want to stay put. I'm not saying it's fishy, but as soon as I mentioned moving up in the draft, they gave me the hard rap sign. They told me to finish up. So, coach, let me come to you for closing comments tonight. And Tom will come to you after that. Just some closing thoughts as you move forward towards the offseason and towards the draft. Well, like I mentioned before, it's a real exciting time. And one of the things that I think you'll find that's unique about this particular group, and it's a personnel office as well as a coaching staff kind of working together. And what we're trying to create is just obviously our own image and identity, that we want passionate men that love the game. They're intelligent. Nobody can outwork them. Nobody will outhit them, right? But the other thing is that we have to be able to make certain that we develop a very, very competitive atmosphere. That's how we're going to get better. That's how we're going to get win. That's how we're going to win. Every single time a guy walks out on the practice field, he's being challenged. He's been challenged in the meeting room. He's been challenged out there on the field. Right? And you get that kind of competition, obviously you're going to start to see some things happen. So we all work together. It's a great synergy amongst us. And, uh, and obviously we're going to continue to work in that direction with the draft and et cetera. But working with our players, man, it's, um, it's going to be fun.